Listeners, readers, welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a better understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. Today, I'm so excited to dive back into one of my favorite Irish writers, Claire Keegan, so late in the day. So I feel like Claire Keegan has kind of done this trick on us where we have had these two volumes that have been so incredibly uh, rich and subtle and spare and interesting and complicated and that we have um, really gotten entranced really by this incredible writing. In both of those we have these stories that are, that are fairly dark, but but that really are talking about some sort of a heroic arc, some sort of some measure of of hope in the darkness. And here I feel like with so late in the day, we are shifting away from these young girls who are kind of at the heart of these stories. We're shifting toward mature women who really have a lot to say about misogyny. I mean, wow. So I'm going to say um, right from the top here too, though, that these books are so incredibly appealing. The three of them together make such a beautiful like little trio, depending on how passive aggressive you'd like to be this holiday season. Wrap this up and give it to your favorite misogynist and just like see what happens. And interestingly, one of the reasons why that might work is because the titular story, the eponymous story of So Late in the Day, so the main story in here, is a story that is kind of this shape-shifting, evolving, very tricky story. So you might be able to get your, your favorite misogynist like halfway through the story before they realize, in fact, that um, misogyny is very much uh, being condemned in this book. So before I get too far into analysis of the story itself, I want to take a step back and talk about what we're doing today. As always, we'll do a quick little um, uh, moment on why I think you should read this book. We're going to talk a little bit about Keegan as the master of the, the form of these longer short stories. Uh, and then we're going to um, run through, then we're going to dive in to the book. We're going to talk about the, the publication of this volume. Uh, and then we are going to talk about the prose itself and why this prose is absolutely just as well wrought and as, as really beautifully done as all uh, of the rest of, of Claire Keegan's work. We're going to talk about symbolism. This is a book where it's um, symbolism is just one way to sort of enter the story, but it is so rich and I think it's a good way uh, to really look at the depth of this prose. We're going to look at the shifts in the story. Again, I mentioned that this is a story that keeps changing. You sort of think it's one thing and then it shifts into something else and then it shifts into something else in ways that, that honestly I can't remember um, having seen, certainly not recently, in in uh, in short fiction or frankly in any fiction. We're going to then talk about misogyny and her treatment of misogyny. Then we're going to talk about the intrusion of the past into the short story in this particular case, which is very interesting given um, Ireland, uh, which we're going to talk about, given Ireland in specific. We're going to talk about some extras. Um, these are things that we are not going to have time to talk about today, which is a little ironic because we're only going to talk about the, uh, the main story so late in the day, the title story. And, um, you know, we're only going to talk for 45 minutes, maybe an hour. But I know that there is going to be so much stuff in here that we are not going to get a chance uh, to touch on. So I'm just going to list those things so you can explore them on your own. And then we will take a look at the close of the story. Okay, so um, quick note on the background here, because this is a, a book that is very sort of um, heavily devoted to misogyny, I really felt like just like sitting in a very very feminine kind of place. I put on a pink shirt. Um, this wall actually used to be pink. Now it's looking like, I don't know, it's looking a little gray to me here on camera. Um, but I've got my, my purple, I've got my purple, and I've got my cat next to me here. This is very feminine. She, there she is, there's my cat. Um, she was just prowling around a second ago, which made me a little nervous that perhaps we had a little mouse friend somewhere around here, but I think she just was coming to say hello. Um, so that, hence the setting, hence the setting. 
But um, I really want to talk very briefly here about why you should read this book. So first of all, um, it is for those of you who are fans of Keegan, and I would not suggest this is the first thing you read by her. In fact, I definitely like the order of um, either one of the other two and then diving into this work, but um, it certainly does not disappoint, which is a very, very good reason to read it. So in terms of Keegan being the master of this short story form, first of all, um, we've talked th th this word lapidary. So lapidary is kind of jewel-like or gem-like. You can imagine um, like somebody piecing together, um, you know, like a, a beautiful ring or a beautiful necklace or bracelet or something. Um, it really is that kind of attention. You have this attention to detail and the way things are fitting together and the way that different to extend the metaphor, different colors are working together. All of this, you know, in terms of texture and in terms of all of the different elements of the short story, she is leaving nothing unturned. I mean, this is just an incredibly, incredibly well done piece of fiction. Famously, Claire Keegan, she's like the opposite of prolific, um, in part because it takes her a long, long, long time to uh, write and because she spends lots and lots of time rewriting. I did not hear this from Claire herself. This is what I have gathered from different interviews and, and essays and whatnot. Um, another thing I've gathered from a very interesting interview or essay or something is that um, Claire Keegan, for a long time when she's teaching, she was teaching short fiction and she was wanting to uh, have her students understand the difference between drama and tension. And interestingly, she kept using, you know, her, her students, she is a fa in favor of tension, not drama. And her students were like, well, what's an example of a story where there's tension and not drama? And so she would give this example, the example uh, of, of essentially the story of So Late in the Day, and then finally decided, in fact, that she would try to write it. So this short fiction is, uh, is the result of that example that she kept giving. And I love the idea of drama versus tension. It's a very useful way to take a close look at, at the prose and, and at, again, this sort of shape-shifting nature of this story that I think is unique and so powerful. In general, though, Keegan, again, is just this absolute master of the form. You have this kind of care that is taken, this kind of lapidary kind of care that is taken with the prose, but you also have incredible subtlety. So this is not um, work that's full of all sorts of, um, you know, floweriness. Like on that level, it's kind of like not like, um, you know, some fancy bracelet or necklace or something. In fact, it's very subtle and very stripped down and very spare. So um, you, you have um, prose and, and word choice and diction and syntax that is deceptively simple, but yet is working so, so hard. When she uses figurative language, which is a lot, she is really getting the most out of that figurative language. Same thing with dialogue, same thing with dialect. I mean, she's just an absolute master of all of these very sort of writerly things when it comes to fiction. Um, figurative language, um, you know, those of you who need a quick reminder, is just when words mean more than what they simply uh, denote on the page. So, you know, symbolism or a metaphor when she's talking about, you know, a cow, maybe she's not just talking about a cow, she's talking about, you know, a metaphor for women who are sort of beasts of burden, who are meant to produce and to, um, you know, provide uh, young calves and are meant to nurture and, um, you know, are sort of, uh, you know, domesticated and owned and all of all of those good things. I'm really on the misogyny train today. So we have this incredible subtleness. We also, though, have this incredible inventiveness. So she um, just, I mean, every single word is so carefully chosen and there is lots of inventiveness. Either there's a very sort of particular feel to her prose that I do find very inventive despite the, the, the sort of simplicity of it. So one of the things that I have um, been interested in while I'm thinking about Irish literature in general and think, and especially contemporary Irish literature. So, you know, in the last sort of 50 years, you're seeing a lot of women who are writing. And, and one of the things that I have been reading about a bit 
is this idea of kind of revisioning what Ireland has meant for women and what it is like to be a woman in Ireland. And um, one important note is that when when um, when Ireland became its own republic, I believe it's 1914. I should really have that in mind right now. Um, that women's rights actually were either sort of stymied and did not move apace with the rest of the world, or in fact went kind of backward. So. You have actually that beautiful thing in Foster where you have that paragraph at the beginning that is a, a, an excerpt from the proclamation of like independence um, of, of the Republic of Ireland. And, and uh, what she highlights there is this idea that all of the children should be given equal access to all of these different resources. And yet, of course, um, that does not happen because you have all of these orphans and especially all of these young girls who are really treated very badly by the state and by the church. So as the church and the state are functioning together, that is another reason why women uh, were having a hard time moving forward with rights. So things like, you know, you had to be married in order to be, um, in order to work, uh, in order to have a job, in order to own property, I believe, if you could even own property. I'm not even sure that you could. Um, things, the access to any kind of birth control was crazy. I think until the 1980s, I feel like 1985, you had to have a prescription to buy condoms. So there, there was this, you know, you think of these large Irish Catholic families, that was not by choice. It was because access to uh, birth control and certainly to any kind of abortion um, was was incredibly stymied by, um, by the state and by the church. And you also have this idea of, of um, you know, this raising up of women and that you're either, you know, the, the Mary who is providing, you know, this savior uh, through immaculate conception, or you are, you know, this fallen woman. So that was a little bit of a digression, but important historical uh, uh, context for understanding the way that Keegan is sort of revisioning what it is to be a woman in Ireland and um, looking back in lots of ways further past Irish independence to some of the kind of not religious, like the pagan kind of stuff that was happening in Ireland before, um, you know, sort of the modern era. So there's a lot of looking to, um, you know, these pagan rites and, and old Irish traditions and folklore and all of these kind of very, very ancient things that you know, look a lot like superstition. You know, when you see a superstitious thing happening in one of her works, um, you, you know, you can, you can read that as sort of a way to circumvent the church. The other way that she is circumventing both church and state is with this real attention to nature. So um, on some level, there's this sort of thinking that if nature is God, like if people are looking to nature as kind of this, this God-like force, um, then in fact, you are not looking to the Catholic Church for this godlike force. So I have really enjoyed this as a lens through which to look at Keegan because there's a ton of uh, nature and there's this real um, sort of uh, presence in her work of domestic animals and also of free animals. So um, we talked before about the dogs in Foster and they're all really, um, well, there's the problem, of course, uh, that one of them was responsible for the death of the boy. Um, but you have this, that the, the, these domesticated animals are, are really negative. A lot of the dogs are growling, they're on chains, they're barking, um, they're used as sort of defensive guards. And, and you get the sense that there's a certain sort of male aspect to them. But so these domesticated animals are seen as either um, like really violent or you have a lot of domesticated, you don't have a lot of domesticated birds, but you have a lot of free birds. So the word hen, um, you know, if you think of like a hen party and a stag party in the UK is like, you know, like a bachelorette party. You have this idea of hens and birds as being um, women and derogatory terms for women. So you don't see a lot of hens in the work of Keegan. In fact, what you see are these birds who are free. You see tons and tons of other birds. You see crows, lots and lots of those in um, in. Uh, I cannot remember the name of this book ever, small things like these. You see all of those crows and you see all of these free birds. There are lots of birds um, throughout all of her work. There are a lot of cats. So with cats, you have both this kind of feminine, feline, kind of wily, cagey, standoffish, aloof, magical kind of thing um, that, that you read into a cat. 
as opposed to a dog, which is kind of, you know, weirdly, we sort of associate more with the masculine um, and that kind of puppy-ish kind of energy when it's not, a, you know, a dog that is guarding and, and trying to bite you. So you have this presence of animals, domestic versus wild in her work. And that is this incredible uh, ability that she has to, to bring these elements. Again, it feels very simple. She's just mentioning a heifer in Foster who has lost her way. Um, but in fact, we are meant to read all of this different stuff into these animals. So you have this looking um, to folklore and to nature that, that is just incredibly rich and very, very well done. Okay, so we're going to move on now to um, talk about the publication of her works. So, so late in the day is a it's a it's a compilation of three stories. the The first one, so late in the day, was first published in the New Yorker in 2022. So it's just come out in book form. And what they have done is they have combined um, so late in the day, which again came out in the, and Foster also did come out in the New Yorker. It was slightly abridged. But so late in the day, I believe the whole story came out in the New Yorker in 2022, and they are releasing it now in 2023. It is combined with The Long and Painful Death that was written in 2007. That was part of Walk the Blue Hills, Blue Fields, Walk the Blue Fields, which was another collection of Claire Keegan's. And then the final story, the final of the three is called Antarctica. And it was published in 1999 in, um, in a collection called Antarctica. So it's interesting to me that the three stories in the collection move backwards in time. So that's one of the reasons why we're going to spend most of our time today talking about so late in the day, because it's the most recent book. And, and for my money, it's the most sort of um, mature and the most successful and the most kind of rich and beautiful um, and rewarding story to really dig into. The other two, um, I was so impressed by the way the three fit together. And it certainly made me think about the fact that Claire Keegan has been really thinking about misogyny for a long time here. Um, the other two stories are also very strong and really interesting, but I think they um, it, it's, it feels slightly less mature. In some ways, I thought it would be interesting, you know, in a class, for example, to read them in reverse order, to read Antarctica first because it appeared in 1999, then to read um, The Long and Painful Death, which came out in 2007, and then to read uh, the most recent. I mean, you could do a really interesting study to see sort of how her work is evolving, simply in terms of the prose and in terms of what she is doing with dialogue and dialect and figurative language. I mean, it would really be interesting. But So Late in the Day is a story that is just, it's absolutely um, one that rewards rereading and certainly rewards a digging into. Speaking of digging into it, um, The New Yorker has a podcast where they have an author on and the author reads a story by another writer. And I love them because I always am so interested in what the author is going to choose. So most recently, So Late in the Day was chosen by George Saunders. And um, it was interesting when I first read this, I was like, I just don't know if I even like this story. I mean, I knew how good it was and I knew like how rewarded I was going to be when I dug into it and how well done and incredible it was, but I'm not sure I really liked it in the way that I really, really liked Foster and I also very much liked um, small things like these. So I was really interested in the fact that George Saunders chose that story which is really a story about misogyny, um, to read and to talk about with Deborah Treisman, who is the fiction editor at The New Yorker. So I loved what he had to say, which was that he can tell from Claire Keegan, and he read the past two stories, uh, or the past two volumes, and was absolutely blown away, and was really looking forward to this most recent story of hers, and was absolutely not disappointed. And what he loves most about her work is he can tell she's someone who takes a lot of care with her stories and does a lot of rewriting and does a lot of very um, you know, long and sort of drawn out thinking about how to make them rich and rewarding and how to make every single word be you know, weight bearing and significant and important. And she certainly does that. 
He also, um, this was something that I had noticed and I was so happy that he spoke a bit about it. Um, he, he talks a lot about how the story, you sort of think it's one thing and then it does this kind of shift on you and then suddenly it's becoming something else and then it shifts again and it's something else. It's a really, really interesting experience because in lots of ways, you as the reader are sort of implicated. Like you realize that you're having certain feelings about someone and then everything shifts and you're like, oh my gosh, wait, now I'm feeling completely differently about this person. Um, and, and it's a very, very interesting experience, certainly. Okay, so finally, we're gonna take um, a dive into the actual book. So as always, I love the cover art. I think it's so smart that they, um, that they put out one um, again, close to the holidays, that looks so much like the other. I mean, if if you're like me and you have the other two together on your bookcase, you just can barely wait to get this one right up there with its two um, with its two buddies. So, um, and I, I like this, um, it's apparently a lino type is what the, um, no, a lino cut. And it's by a woman named Paula Publi, P-O-B-L-I, um, which I love it that it's by a woman. It seems very appropriate. I actually looked at the acknowledgments and um, it's all women who are in the acknowledgments who she's thanking, except there are two people. Um, one is named uh, uh, Alex, which, you know, kind of an androgynous name, very difficult to know. And there is a Nile in there, but all the rest of them are women. So I was, I'm just, I'm interested in this notion of, of Claire Keegan as this real feminist. I did also think it's very interesting. Um, there's a woman, the last person who she is thanking um, here or acknowledging is Sabine West, West, West Spicer. Westbizer, Westbizer, um, but which is very interesting to me because of the fact that the woman um, in the story in so late in the day is named Sabine. Each one of these uh, lino cuts that have been on the on the cover, I actually don't know if it's Paula who did the other two, um, but the other two are very uh, significant in terms of snow and you know you have the rooftops and this idea of not being able to see into the town and the idea of being above things and and having things be secret. In this case, I think this is Dublin. I don't really know. Um, maybe this is the River Liffey, uh, but it, I don't I don't know the skyline well enough. But certainly, um, you have to imagine that this is a major uh, Irish city. And um, I, I really, I like the idea again here of, of showing buildings, but having this kind of natural force. The, the river is a very big deal um, in, uh, in small things like these. And so you have this real sense here uh, again of the river. I imagine this is Dublin. There is a lot of James Joyce that I see in Claire Keegan's work. So I would imagine, um, and James Joyce's work is, is all set in Dublin. So there is this real sense of, of uh, the river as being important. In fact, it's the only part that's sort of um, echoed on the back. Okay, we're gonna dive into the title now. So um, I really like the title. It's, it's so Claire Keegan talks about the fact that she's not great at, at picking titles and that her, her process is mainly um, to go back through a story and to pull out the title. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. And we have the title at the very, very end, which we're going to look at. It's important because I do think we have this sense here of, of things as being kind of too late for this guy. I mean, this guy, his name is Kohal, Kohal, oh my gosh, um, Kohal, Kohal, I think we say Kohal. So at the end of the book, you really do have at the end of the story, you have this sense of him as things being a little late for him. Like he's just not going to be able to make the changes that he needs to make, which is both like a real downer, but it is also this sense of, of him finally coming to some sort of reckoning. So I really do like that title. I like, um, I like the way that it fits also with small things like these. It's different from Foster, um, but, but it, you know, it's probably gonna be hard for me to remember because I can barely remember small things like these, but I do like these kind of fragmentary uh, titles that she pulls out. There is something also that feels very uh, Irish to me. There's something about Irish syntax. I'm learning Irish on Duolingo. So um, at one point in one of these things, I was like, oh, I'm not a very, I don't really have any idea about Irish syntax. Now I'm learning more and more about Irish syntax. And in fact, the incredible ways that Claire Keegan uses dialect. So you see in her writing some of these Irish kind of um, formulations of language. Like one of them is that um, you'll have, if somebody asks a question, instead of saying yes or no, they'll repeat the verb 
um, with like the negative or positive. So you have you have these kinds of structures that are coming from the Irish, but in fact they are written, you know, they're written in English, but you have this kind of Irish feel to them. And certainly some of the word order is Irish, but this idea of so late in the day, um, it, for, for whatever reason, maybe just because I'm wanting to hear it, it does feel like it has kind of an Irish, um, you know, feel to it. It also for some reason feels like Joyce to me. Um, it, it, this, there's a lot of this story that reminds me of The Dead, which is a story at the end of Dubliners. So late in the day it does feel like it has a certain resonance with, uh, with James Joyce. So those of you who are here to be better readers, all you have to do is notice things carefully. It's very important to notice that, that there is a subtitle here. So this is new. There is not a subtitle in the other two volumes. The subtitle is Stories of Women and Men. So I really like the way that she has that ordered. So women and men, I think we tend, partially because of the number of syllables, but also probably because of the patriarchy, we usually tend to say men and women. Um, you know, how many men and women were there? It's just like one of these kind of English, um, you know, we tend to have things with one syllable first, followed by this two syllable word. But this idea of stories of women and men, we have this reversal here where she is putting women first, which I really love. It's also really important that she is focusing us on purpose at the beginning here on this idea of, of these stories being about men and women. You certainly couldn't say that about Foster and you couldn't say it about small things like these, both of which have you know this focus on, on younger people. But here we have um, this focus on, uh, on men and women. And in fact, all three of the stories, I mean, it's, in, it's interesting to me how well they do fit together and how men and women, you know, it, it feels very stripped down and very spare. And like we are very carefully examining three different instances of a woman and a man together and all the ways that things can just really go wrong. So um, I really appreciate the subtitle and I really like that it's there. And it's just, it's a, it's a really good addition, I think, partly to focus, um, focus us as we, as we dive into the work, but also uh, simply as, as kind of a, a, an agent of cohesion for the three different stories in the, uh, in the collection. It's very important to note too, that when this story was published in France, it was published under the title Misogyny. So I think um, this idea of publishing it under the name Misogyny, I'm glad that they didn't do that here um, because it seems a little heavy handed to me, but it is a very important um, piece of the fact that Claire Keegan and the editors and publishers are really um, you know, acknowledging the fact that this has everything to do with misogyny. Okay, we're going to finally dive into the text itself. So um, we're going to take a look at the epigraph that's at the very beginning of the whole collection here. Um, we, we, first, we have this dedication for Loretta Kinsella. Um, I, I noted, it did a lot of sleuthing here, was not able to come up with a lot of information. But Kinsella, of course, is the last name of the people who adopt um, the young girl in Foster. So um, I also did in my sleuthing, I realized that Loretta, or I discovered that Loretta Kinsella is a librarian in Ireland. So I was like, I don't know, maybe she, maybe there's like some sort of librarian, maybe they're friends or something. I do not know. Don't have great information about Loretta Kinsella. But we um, move from this mysterious Loretta Kinsella person over to the epigraph. So this is um, a fragment of a poem by Philip Larkin. Here it is. It stands plain as a wardrobe, what we know, have always known, know that we can't escape, yet can't accept. One side will have to go. So this idea of an Obad, um, which is the name of this poem, it was written in 1977. He's a very important English poet. And um, it's interesting to read it because if you've read the subtitle carefully and you know that this is a collection, a story of, of women and men, you have this sense of the two sides. If you're watching on um, the YouTube channel, there is really, the light is getting crazy here um, for a quick second, and then it's gonna go down, I think. The sun is going to set, but... Um, Apologies for this crazy lighting that's happening. Um, but, but so we have this idea here of, of this wardrobe, which is this very domestic thing, and this, this thing of um, what, we, what we know and what we can't accept, well, this thing that we have to accept but can't, um, it's, it's standing there as plain as a wardrobe. So um, an Obad is um, a poem that's written early in the day, and this one by Philip Larkin 
is very fixated on death and like the horror of death. So I think what he's talking about here, this thing that we know and that we can't accept is this idea of the human condition, this idea that we're all going to die. But it's so interesting to read it with the subtitle in mind, this idea um, of stories of women and men, because this last part, one side will have to go. You have this idea of two sides, you know, of, of like a feminine side and a masculine side. Um, and, and, and you have this sense of one of them has to go. It's almost as if like the masculine is out. Um, if you're seeing this also on the YouTube channel, that's my cat's tail. My cat's really enjoying this, this whole lecture today. Um, okay, so now we're going to dive in to the first paragraph of So Late in the Day. Again, this was published uh, originally in The New Yorker in 2022, last year. Okay, on Friday, July 29th, Dublin got the weather that was forecast. All morning, a brazen sun shone across Marion Square, reaching onto Koha's desk, where he was stationed by the open window. A taste of cut grass blew in, and every now and then a close breeze stirred the ivy on the ledge. When a shadow crossed, he looked out, a gulp of swallows skirmishing high up in camaraderie. Down on the lawns, some people were out sunbathing, and there were children, and beds plump with flowers, so much life carrying smoothly on, despite the tangle of human upsets and the knowledge of how everything must end. So we have this really beautiful first paragraph uh, that ends with this really ominous tone about how everything must end. And this question of knowledge of how everything must end, there's this really interesting nuance here because it's not just the fact that everything ends, but it's how everything will end. So again, just like in the Philip Larkin poem, we have this kind of overtone of, of death here, that how everything will end is again, sort of the, this, this human condition. Um, but we, I want to look more closely at the prose itself in this first paragraph because it's so incredible. So on Friday, July 29th, Dublin got the weather that was forecast. So Friday is important. It's the end of the work week. Um, there, I think back when I was getting married, my mom made some comment about how you never wanted to get married because there's like this old wives tale or this adage that you don't want to start anything on a Friday. So I think there's sort of this idea of, of Friday as being, um, you know, not really an auspicious day to be beginning things. And yet here we are starting the story on a Friday. It's very important that, um, you know, it may seem insignificant, but someone who's working as hard as Claire Keegan, and in fact, any writer, if this is the second word of the, of the story, and it's the second word of the book, obviously it's important. So we need to take a little time and figure out what uh, Friday would be all about. July 29th, so th there may be some Irish significance to this, but I don't know it. Um, but we're talking about the very end of July. We're talking about sort of, we're moving into August, we're moving into sort of the dog days of summer. Um, so you have the end of, well, getting toward the end of the month of July. Um, so you have the ending of the week, we have the ending of this month, we're moving toward the time, you know, when sort of the, the work year um, in Europe is sort of ending and you might have, I mean, it's not really ending, but like you have that break in August that everybody does and then you start kind of this new year of, of the scholarly year and also a little bit of the work year when everybody comes back in September. So you have this sense of things ending. Um, and then we have this Dublin got the weather that was forecast. This is such an interesting way to phrase this. So it's almost like, like you got the thing that was coming for you or you got what you deserved. So there's this idea that Dublin got the weather that was forecast. Um, and we have this idea too here of, of, again, something ominous. It's not just like the weather was great. It's like Dublin got what was coming to it. Um, and then all morning, a brazen sun shone across Marion Square, reaching onto Cole's desk where he was stationed by the open window. So the brazen sun is um, really like, it's an interesting way to talk about a brazen sun. You have kind of um, like an overtone of like blazing here, but this idea of brazen 
which is close um, to blazing. This brazen sun, it's its what you might say about a woman. You know, it's this idea of a brazen, um, you know, brazen hussy or a brazen trollop or something. If someone's brazen, it's this idea of being overly bold uh, in this way that that is, it's an interesting nuance because you would think in Ireland that, you know, the sun would just be good. But in this case, it's, it's this brazen sun. So names in this story are very important. Koal, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, that's what it told me on uh, the Google. Koal is a battle ruler or a, like a, a, a great warrior, which is so interesting because, of course, uh, very soon in this story, in fact, even at the end of this very first paragraph, we have this idea that this guy, things are not going that great for him, like very early on. And in fact, it generates quite a bit of sympathy because we think something really terrible is um, happening to this guy and something terrible is happening, but it turns out it was, um, you know, fairly well deserved. Uh, but you have this idea of this great warrior who is in fact totally defeated. We also, um, Marion Square, so that's a, it's a square in Dublin, but the word Marion is important because it has to do, it's something of Mars, who, and Mars is the god of war. So again, you have this idea of like a war-like um, presence, this idea of Marion Square. Um, I believe Marion Square too is, um, is, is, it's like a very pretty, very lush and kind of beautiful place. And yet um, we have this kind of lushness and this beauty and this green space in the city. Um, and we have, in fact, Call is by an open window. He should be sort of taking advantage of all of this good weather. And yet all the good weather just ends up feeling sort of, um, sort of ominous. In fact, we have this next kind of strange sentence. A taste of cut grass blew in. So a taste of cut grass. It's interesting because the, the smell of cut grass is, you know, that's a, that's a good smell. But the idea of it being a taste, this idea of senses being kind of mixed, and that idea makes it think maybe it would taste like exhaust or, or, or chemicals or something. So this idea of taste is kind of perverting um, what would otherwise be a positive thing, the smell of cut grass. And then... A close breeze stirred the ivy on the ledge. So a close breeze, a breeze is good, but a close breeze um, it is something, it's it's like an almost um an oxymoron here. Like it's it's um it's it's like a breeze should be refreshing, but it's a close breeze, like it's too kind of um sorry, my cat's doing something crazy here. Um it's it's too uh there's something wrong, there's something kind of off about this breeze because it's a close breeze. Okay. And then um, when a shadow crossed, he looked out. So again, here we have this shadow. These things are already feeling very ominous from the very beginning. Um, and he looks out and what he sees are these free birds. So there are lots and lots of birds that we see in foster and in small things like these. And my my idea, one of one of many, is that um, some, one of the things that the birds are uh, uh, are these non domesticated birds. One of the things that they are um, sort of symbolic of is is the freedom of of women. And often the freedom of that, that women do not in fact have. But in this case. Uh, spoiler alert, we have a woman who has freed herself from a pretty terrible situation. This Sabine has freed herself. And so you have these birds, these swallows, who are um, all together, and, but you have this idea of them skirmishing. Swallows are often, um, they're, they're uh, associated with Aphrodite. So the, the goddess of like love and beauty. Mm, I'm not even checking that. I'm not going to go back and look at that for you. But, um, you know, this is like a, it's a good goddess. Um, so you have a good goddess. I mean, you know, I think it's love and whatever beauty or, or love and sex or I don't know what. Um, but you have the, this association with Aphrodite and swallows and also swallows being good luck. So you have this whole, um, a gulp of swallows and a gulp is like, it's like a um, murder of crows. You know, you have this idea that that's the whole group of them, but the gulp, like it's like a gulp, you know, it, it's sort of like a, um, what is a gulp? That's like a, like, uh-oh, you know, it's that kind of a feel with this gulp of swallows. And then the fact that they are skirmishing and then they're high up in camaraderie. So the, 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 they're doing something that's not very kind of Aphrodite-ish. They're skirmishing, they're having a fight which is adding a little bit to the ominousness, ominousness. And it is also, in fact, foreshadowing some of the skirmishing that Sabine and Koal are going to be doing uh, during the rest of the story. 
So then down on the lawn, some people were sunbathing. So you have the idea of, of people maybe being scantily clad and enjoying their bodies and enjoying the sunshine. And he is stuck in an office where his day is not going very well. So we have down on the lawn, some people were out sunbathing and there were children and beds plump with flowers. So this idea of children comes up again and again and again throughout this piece. And it's very, um, it's very subtle, but it's very important. So we have this thing here called polysyndeton, which is where instead of commas, you use the word and. And one of the things that does is it slows everything down. It does make it mere, feel more sort of lyrical and poetic, but it also raises up all of the sort of things that are in the series. So this idea of some people were out sunbathing, there were children, sorry, so some people were out sunbathing and there were children and beds plump with flowers. So you have this idea of the beds, the children, and the people sunbathing all as being important. In fact, the children are right in the center of that. Then of course, the idea of beds, some beds and plump beds, you have this idea of sex, you have this idea of procreation, you have this idea of how children are made. Um, and again, this is all, if we are reading this for the second time, we understand in fact that his marriage has not taken place and that his um, you know, relationship with Sabine has ended in disaster and he will not be getting into any kind of a bed with her, let alone a plump bed. Uh, and will in fact not have children. There's a point later where he he thinks of the sons he will not have in this very misogynist way because he's only interested in having male progeny. But you do have this preoccupation with him, um, this very sort of narcissistic feeling of him wanting to like, you know, have progeny and procreate. Okay. And then the very last part of this, um, so much life carrying smoothly on despite the tangle of human upsets and the knowledge of how everything must end. So again, we have this kind of very beautiful, um, natural, but like kind of un, like everything's a little uncanny, everything's a little bit off, the taste of the grass, the close breeze. You have these different kinds of things that are making things feel a little off kilter. And then we have the ending, which really is quite ominous, the knowledge of how everything must end. So we have looked at the first paragraph, <laughs> which, um, I mean, honestly, this is how Claire Keegan's work is. Like we could have spent 90 minutes talking about that first paragraph, but we're not going to. Uh, but we're gonna move on to this second paragraph. I want to dig even more deeply into the prose and we're gonna talk here about symbolism because I think this is a, it's a, it's a good uh, way to look at how deftly she is using all uh, forms of figurative language, but also how like intricate and how really, really rich this prose is despite feeling very sort of uh, simple and, and on the sort of surface, it, you know, syntactically and in terms of word choice, it is fairly simple, but it's deceptively simple because in fact, it's very complicated and very rich. Okay, so the, the second paragraph after everything must end begins with this Already the day felt long. So for me, there was a nice kind of resonance with so late in the day. So you have this, this repetition of the word day, and we have this idea of, um, of, of things not going well for him. It's a very clear statement. Already the day felt long. When he looked again at the top of the screen again, it read 1427. So you have that repetition of again, which is telling you it's like reinforcing kind of his misery and how time is not moving forward and how awful things are. Also, um, when she's talking about like, you know, July 29th or 1427, which is 227, you know, in, in the like American parlance, um, you, you have to pay attention to these things because if she's being that specific, she's doing it for a reason, especially someone as skilled as Claire Keegan. So um, the specificity there is very important. And part of it for me, um, this idea of 1427, you have this idea of 24-7, um, if you just kind of reverse those numbers around a little bit. So this idea of, of things like always being the same and of things like happening all the time in this sense of like the day is so long, it's like this day feels like it's been going on for an entire day, sort of 24-7. I'm sure maybe there's more significance to the fact that it's 2.30 in the afternoon-ish, um, or 14 and 27, there may be um, some sort of numerological significance there, but but simply the, uh, the, the way that you can kind of do a little anagram there and get 24-7 is interesting to me. 
He wished now that he had gone out at lunchtime and walked as far as the canal. He could have sat on one of the benches there for a while and watched the mute swans and cygnets gobbling up the crusts and other scraps people threw down there on the water. So, so much is happening in this sentence. First of all, we're talking about this fat regret here. He wished, so we're, you know, right from the beginning, we're having this regret. It's a small regret, but it's kind of um, priming us for a larger regret. We think, we hope he's having some regrets because his engagement has just been called off. Um, you know, we're hoping this guy has some regrets, but we also, um, we're hearing here about a small one and, and just sort of hoping maybe there's some larger ones as well. He wished now, so you have this idea with now, like, you know, something has happened, something has changed. So one important thing to remember is that if you're reading this for the first time, you don't know, in fact, that his marriage is dissolving. And in fact, because there is this kind of ominous sense of time and this ominous sense of like how everything ends, you know, your first thought is that he's dying. Like your first thought when he's like, he wasn't prepared to like hear what he needed to hear, or like look at his phone or whatever that line is in here. Um, you have this sense that he's not ready to hear terrible news about a terminal diagnosis. I mean, in the beginning, you have this real sense of sympathy for him because you're like, oh no, something really terrible is gonna happen to this guy or something terrible is happening and he's having this regret about walking to the canal because maybe his days are numbered and he is gonna die soon. Um, so you have this idea of this regret and he wishes that he walked as far as the canal. So again, you have water, you have the river. Anytime you come across a river, um, in this case, it's a canal. So it's sort of like a man-made one. It's even straighter. It's even more kind of, um, you know, it's not stopping, like it's gonna just go. Um, you have this sense of time passing, you have this sense of mortality, um, and you have this sense of things both always being the same, like a river, you know, it always looks the same, and yet the river is never the same thing twice. So things both always feeling the same, but never being the same. Okay, um, he could have sat on one of the benches there for a while and watched the mute swans and cygnets. So a mute swan um, is, that refers, uh, usually the way that you can tell the difference between a trumpeter swan and a mute swan, I just learned all of this on Google, um, is, is like the males have a different like beak color. There's something orange on one of them. But the idea of a mute swan, so swans are, you know, birds that are often, um, uh, you know, in relationship to love. And you think of like the two of them together, but you have this, this mute swans, um, they, they have no voice. So you have this idea of, of birds that are associated with love and partnership and, and like, um, you know, romance as um, not having a voice, which is significant because he has been muted in the sense that he is no longer in conversation uh, with his fiance. You also, um, with the swans, you have the cygnets who are the baby swans and what they are gobbling up, both the swan parents and the, the cygnets, um, are, are the scraps that people are throwing to them. So you have the idea of the crusts and other scraps that people throw. You know, he at this point is only being left things like scraps. So he's sort of identifying with this idea of these mute uh, swans. Okay, without meaning to, he closed the budget distribution file he'd been working on before saving it. So now he's made a mistake. I mean, this poor guy, like in the beginning, again, when you're first reading this, you have a lot of sympathy for him and you're like, oh my God, now he has screwed up something at work. A flash of something not unlike contempt flared through him then. So this is one of the things um, we have talked about before in, in when we're talking about Irish writing, this idea of um, because Irish men are subject to colonialization on the part of England and they're sort of lesser than because they are not English, also unemployment, also um, all of the sectarian violence, also all the alcoholism and a very sort of repressed community, the Catholic Church. There are lots of ways in which Irish men really don't have it easy. Um, Irish women also do not have it easy, but there is a lot of self-contempt. Like this is one of the themes of, of um, like the big theme in Joyce is a lot of paralysis, which in fact leads to a lot of contempt and self-contempt. So this idea of um, he makes a mistake and then what he feels for himself is contempt. He cannot feel compassion for himself. He feels contempt. 
Um, it's it's so sad, actually. And again, if you think the guy's going to get, you know, bad news about a, um, you know, a, a, a terminal diagnosis instead of bad news that his fiance is not interested in him anymore, there's a tremendous amount of sympathy that is generated here because he's also not that good at his job. So um, we also, again, talking about symbolism here, just like the swans and the um, and the crusts and whatnot. He's budgeting. He's not. He's not able to do this thing at work. He's not able to do this budget file. I'm literally having to like. I'm going to crouch down here. Um, those of you on the YouTube can see that I'm being blasted by. It's a brazen sun. This is just like the story. I'm being blasted by a brazen sun. Um, but we, you have this sense of him as not being able to budget well and also not being able to close something out well. Like he's he's closing the file before finishing it. He, he didn't get married and get divorced. He was not able to do that. It's sort of like he wasn't able to budget. He also, um, there's a lot of stuff about money in this book. There's also quite a bit about money and small things like these. It's a real tension between Bill Furlong and his wife. So you have this sense of, of money as being very important, partly because there is just this crushing poverty um, and unemployment during the era of uh, small things like these, because it's 1985. But you have um, you have this sense of, of everybody being sort of pressed and everybody under stress uh, and him not being able to budget and money as being something that that he's very uh, he's very stingy and he's very tight fisted and it ends up being a real problem. That's also something that he has inherited from his father. And he's very clear about having inherited this kind of, you know, this generational legacy of being very uh, stingy. Wow. I mean, so much symbolism here. Then he got up and walked down the corridor as far as the men's room where there was no one and pushed into a stall. So he goes into the men's room and there's no one in there. So you have this sense of, um, of, of isolation, of being by himself. And he's going into a space where, um, you know, you would expect other men to be, but there's this real sort of dearth of any kind of community for him. And then um, he pushed into a stall. So you have this idea that he's getting ready to do something very intimate. He's getting ready to defecate. But we, we learn very soon that he's not, in fact, going in there because he needs to defecate. Uh, for a while, he sat on the lid, looking at the back of the door on which nothing was written or scrawled until he felt a bit steadier. So he's sitting on the lid of the toilet, which is, again, another one of these circumstances where he is not able to finish something. So or he's he's like with the budget thing that he has closed out before it was finished. He goes in to do, you know, he goes to sit in a bathroom stall and doesn't do what you normally do in a bathroom stall if you are a man. In fact, he's sitting on the lid. There's sort of an impotence here. Um, Later, at the very end of the story, he urinates and it's very satisfying for him. And you get a sense, but only momentarily, you get this real sense that that um, this inability to like have his body even produce urine or feces is like a real, it's like a real problem for him. It's also so symbolic of him not being able, um, you know, to sort of get everything out, not being able to express himself, not being able to be in touch with his body. All of that is, is uh, you know, connoted by this scene in the bathroom. He's also looking at the back of the stall where nothing is written or scrawled. So there's not even, there's not even graffiti. There's also not that, this is just occurring to me, there's not that like, um, you know, for a good time called blah, 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 or some sort of, that's very antiquated and talk about misogynist. But there's this sense here that 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 he's not having any communication, that he's entirely isolated, and he's not even getting like bad news there. It's just an empty void that he is staring into, which is symbolic of his future. And this idea of him not feeling steady, again, at this point, if you're reading it for the first time, you still have quite a bit of sympathy for this guy. Like you're like, oh gosh, like he's feeling unsteady because something terrible is either about to happen or has happened. We're gonna finish up just the very end of this paragraph. Then he went to the basin and splashed water on his face and slowly dried his face and hands on the paper towel, which fed automatically from the dispenser. So this idea of washing his face, um, the water that he's splashing, he's not using soap. So you can you have this idea of maybe holy water, of a baptism, of a renewal, of a cleansing. He's trying to sort of cleanse himself. He's maybe even trying for some sort of like a rebirth here. He's washing away his sins. He's washing away, um, you know, whatever this unsteadiness is. 
and then when he's drying his face and hands with this paper towel that that uh, fed automatically out of the dispenser, it's a little bit like the canal in that you have this kind of man-made object that's like inexorable, like it's just going to keep coming, and this paper towel is just going to keep coming at him. Um, it, it it's fed automatically from the dispenser, so he's out of control, and this thing is just sort of coming at him. You can be thinking to yourself like, "Whoa, you're reading a lot here into a paper towel dispenser," but in fact, and you can tell from the care and from from the fact that the prose is very spare, but the details speak volumes. That she spends an enormous amount of time choosing exactly the right image, exactly the right word, the exact right date, the time, all of it is, is uh, chosen with much, much care. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is talk about some of these incredible shifts that we have as we are moving through the story. So in the very beginning, you have this idea of everything coming to an end. Everything's like a little off. Everything is a little bit uncanny. Uh, you have the sense of him as being unsteady. And in the beginning, that all generates a decent amount of, of, uh, of sympathy for our main character. But things are going to change. So on page six, we have this, um, this interaction with his boss. You know there's no need to stay in, the boss said. Why don't you call it a day? So... That's kind of our first inkling, like the boss, who's also younger, 10 years younger, and he dresses really like, like kind of like uh, spiffy, that is not the word that she used, um, that uh, he wore designer suits and played squash at the weekends. That's the description of this guy. And um, he, the older guy, Koal, who is having this terrible day and, you know, his life is kind of going off the rails here. Um, his shoes are unpolished and he feels old and obsolete. And, and again, so late in the day, like thing, it's too late. It's too late for, for our main guy here. So we have this idea um, of the boss as saying like, you know what, you can, you can leave, which is adding to this tension. So we can go back to that idea of tension versus drama. Literally nothing is happening in the story yet but there's an enormous amount of tension that is being generated. Then he says, I'm just finishing the budget outline now, Koal said. I'd like to get this much done. So you have this idea like he's gotta get something done because nothing is going right. Fair enough, the boss says, whatever, take her handy. So this idea of take her handy, um, it, this idea of taking someone's hand in marriage, take her handy must be like take it easy or like, you know, it, it must be an Irish phrase. But this idea of taking someone's hand or asking for someone's hand, it's um, ironic on a second reading because, of course, his marriage uh, proposal was not, well, it was initially successful and now is not so successful. Okay, so on page six, we have the interaction with the boss, which is kind of heightening this uh, this sense of tensions ratcheting up, but um, we still have a lot of sympathy for our main character. Okay, on page nine, he would ordinarily have taken out his mobile then to check his messages, but found he wasn't ready then wondered if anyone ever was ready for what was difficult or painful. So again, the tension is ratcheting up some more because we know that this guy is about to experience something that was difficult or painful. And at this point, you're thinking like, uh-oh, he's going to get some bad news from his doctor. This is definitely a terminal uh, diagnosis. At least that's what I was thinking. Uh, and then we are going to move on to page 13. So we're shifting backwards in time here. And um, we, we, at the beginning of this uh, chapter two, which is, it's very nice. Again, lots of um, the elements of Claire Keegan's work are very clear. So you have these nice chapters. You have a very clear, um, you know, uh, signpost about going back into the past. Uh, so it's not, none of the prose is like tricky. It's just very uh, rich. Little more than a year ago, he had almost run down the stairwell from the office to meet Sabine at the entrance to Marion Square. So we have here, um, suddenly things are shifting. So you think you're reading this story potentially about some very bad news that he's going to get. My mind went straight to some sort of terrible diagnosis, some terrible health crisis. But then with the entrance of Sabine and the idea that little more than a year ago, he was very excited about this woman, all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait, something's going to happen with Sabine. There's no way that someone as talented as Claire Keegan is going to toss this in and then, you know, 
well, we don't think probably that she would then move on with our first hypothesis. So we're having this first shift here. So um, Sabine, by the way, um, it's it, she is she's half French and she's half English. That's very important because she is not Irish. And as a woman, um, Claire Keegan, as an Irish woman, she's talking about the uh, you know the plight of an Irish woman. So it's very important that this woman who is able to free herself, this Sabine, who is able to get out of this unpromising marriage to this terribly misogynist, tight-fisted jerk of a guy, is not Irish. She is, in fact, from France and England. And so you get this sense that she's able to free herself from a fate um, that was potentially something uh, that Irish women might not have been able to, uh, to free themselves from. As with all things Claire Keegan, uh, the name is very symbolic here. So the Sabine women, I think is how you say it. The name would be Sabine, um, but I think the Sabine women, they were um, women who were rounded up by the Romans. And you have this very, they're like lots of works of art. I'll throw a couple up on the screen if you're watching the YouTube channel. The rape of the Sabine women is when the Romans went around the surrounding areas and, and took all of the women and uh, basically like kidnapped them all and brought them all together. It's um, the rape of the Sabine women is sometimes it's like a little bit of a misnomer because rapto or I think that's how you would say it um, is like a, like a kidnapping. Like it's like um, raptar in Spanish, like to, to, to like take something away, like a raptor. Um, you know, that idea of kidnapping somebody um, is sometimes mistranslated as the rape of the Sabine women, but obviously part of the reason they were being kidnapped was in order uh, to be sexual objects of the Romans. So these the, the idea here, um, you know, it's, as we've said before on the Fox page, it's important to note something like this and to maybe like understand Oh my gosh, this, the, the brazen sun, people, the brazen sun's really just doing a number on me here. Um, but this idea of this woman, um, Sabine, is very, very resonant with this idea of these women who, in fact, were kidnapped and who were raped and who were, um, you know, the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, by they were held against their will by the Roman people. So you have this long legacy. It could feel like very heavy handed. And yet it's totally not because I think a lot of people, I did not know that. I didn't remember. But because it was Claire Keegan, I was like, I got to look this up because because, you know, this is going to be an important resonance. So we have this idea of Sabine as being someone um, who is being held against her will. But in fact, she is really uh, someone who has a lot of agency throughout the story, which is very important. Okay, and then we're going to move to page 14 to see a little bit more how things are shifting. So um, on page 14, we're having one of the first inklings of how things are gonna be moving around. Um, so we've had a lot of sympathy for Coal until now. And then we have this, the woman could cook. Even now he had to say that much for her. So not great. Like this is one of those things I think by the, I think I have like a hmm in the column there. So you have like the first beginnings of this idea of, of him as being a little misogynist. The woman could cook. I mean, that's just not like, that is not a very respectful way to talk about what is really actually a very accomplished skill on the part of Sabine. And this very kind of beautiful way that she is often, um, you know, spending a lot of time preparing food for him in a very nurturing way. And um, he sort of appreciates it, but not really. Okay, then we're gonna look on page 18. So the plot, as they say, is thickening a little here on page 18. So he, she has made this tart for him. And again, he's concerned about money and is uh, very put out because in fact, he has to spend six pounds on uh, these beautiful cherries that she very painstakingly turns into a tart for him. There's a lot of resonance there with the idea of cherries and virginity and a, a woman as uh, being a tart, you know, who is sexually active. Also the idea of things being not sweet and being tart. Um, I mean, this is the kind of 
symbolism that we have throughout this entire story. But then we have this interaction between the two of them that is helping the story shift yet again. Why don't we marry? Why don't we? She let out a sound, a type of choked laughter. What sort of way is this of asking? It seems like you are almost making some type of argument against it. So you have this idea here, as they say, the plot is thickening because it, you know, he is, he's not doing a very good job of proposing. And so as the reader, you are adding to this idea of like, wait, maybe this is not a great guy. Maybe I shouldn't have so much, uh, you know, uh, sympathy for him. Then we're going to move to page 26. So this is when he has returned home. And this is a yet another one of those times where the story is shifting a little further. We, this is such an interesting passage because he has this cat and the cat is often a stand in, um, in, in the other, uh, Claire Keegan books. And actually you have a lot of cats in Anna Burns, who is an Irish woman who wrote Milkman. Um, you have the association with this feline as a woman, uh, and he says at one point later something about children and, um, you know, if it, he, that she would maybe want to have a child with him and that at least they could get a cat. So um, they do, in fact, have this cat. And in fact, he's actually very cruel to the cat. But at this point, um, he is, uh, you know, calling out for the cat. As soon as he had the door closed, he felt the house unusually still and quiet. He stood for a minute and called out to Matilda, the cat. When he called again and still there was no sound, his heart lurched and he went looking until he found her in the bathroom. He must have locked her in there by mistake before he'd left for work. He unlocked the back door and let her out, then opened the fridge. So you have this idea of him as locking this cat in. And again, I think we can read the cat as a stand-in for Sabine. Importantly, Matilda is also um, a very important word, a very important name, and it has to do also with being a really good uh, fighter. So speaking of the plot thickening, here we have him opening the fridge and finds a phallus-shaped cake with flesh-colored icing, which his brother had ordered as a joke for the stag party. So things are becoming more and more clear. And again, this whole thing is shifting and you still maybe have a little bit of sympathy, but as things unfold further, you get a better sense of how in fact misogynist this guy is. But we're gonna look um, again at these shifts that are occurring. Uh, just two more examples of that. So on page 29, Interestingly, right in the middle of the page, there is this note that she is not superstitious, which is important because, again, that's sort of a non-Irish thing. So there are things about this woman who are, you know, she's forthright and she has a voice and she is uh, not willing to kind of stick around in this not great situation, in part because she is French and English. So um, then down a little bit further, that was part of the trouble, the fact that she would not listen and wanted to do a good half of things her own way. So this is a little bit reminiscent of the Philip Larkin um, poem that we have in the beginning, this idea that half has to go and that it can't be accepted. Um, but you have this sense of like, you're like, wait, what? Of course, half of, half of what she wants to do, um, she wants to do things her own way, she should. You know, you start realizing that you are very close to this uh, main character in terms of the narrative stance, and you're kind of in his thoughts. And these are thoughts that are not respectful of women of women at all. And then finally, I want to look at um, pages 34 and 35. This is such a good example, again, of how the thing is shifting because Claire Keegan does this very cool thing where you are kind of revisiting a couple of things that happen early and, and you're sort of implicated as the reader. So um, this is when uh, Sabine is talking to him very clearly about her reservations and she has gone out to, uh, to have drinks with um, Cynthia, who is one of the women in the office. Sabine is talking about what Cynthia had said. She said, things may now be changing, but that a good half of men your age just want us to shut up and give you what you want, that you're spoiled and turn contemptible when things don't go your way. So again, she's speaking very forcefully and very clearly about this. At one point, he says that her grasp of the English language is not that great, which is so rude, um, but it also is probably because he doesn't like what she's saying. Also because, you know, she's half French, so and she lived in France. She grew up in France, so, you know, a lot of her um, language would be just accented and, and modified because she had some French roots. So um, this idea then, 
He wanted to deny it, but it felt uncomfortably close to a truth he had not once considered. It occurred to him that he would not have minded her shutting up right then and giving him what he wanted. It's so genius. So she says right here, um, half the men your age just want us to shut up and give you what you want, that you're spoiled and turn contemptible when things don't go your way. And then he says, he would, it occurred to him that he would not have minded her shutting up right then and giving him what he wanted. It's so skilled the way that um, the way that that Claire Keegan is is uh, giving us what what Cynthia has said, and then literally we have our uh, main character reinforcing that idea. We have another example of this on page thirty five. She also said that to some of you, we are just cunts, that she often hears Irish men referring to women in this way and calling us whores and bitches. In fact, Carl's brother calls her a whore on page 42. So very soon, you're going to have another example of what this is that Cynthia is saying is, is essentially coming true and is being embodied by our main character. And then she goes on to say, Monica, the Polish cleaner, told her that you were the only person in the whole building who didn't give her so much as a card at Christmas. Is this true? So again, he's really getting, um, you know, he's having this confrontation with Sabine and she's asking for the truth from him. And he doesn't, he can't even remember if he gave her a, uh, a tip. So you have this misogyny here in that he had an interaction earlier with her, with this young woman, Monica. We find out her name later. Monica is a, a, a name that means some, someone that gives advice or someone who is unique. And yet when he sees her earlier, he calls her the Polish girl who does the cleaning. So you have this sense of each of these things that he is being accused of are things that we are seeing him do. It's so skillful. It's really, um, really just incredible. So um, I want to then touch on some issues of misogyny. These are some of the times where we see um, this very, very clear misogyny that, that Claire Keegan is showing us. It's interesting that a lot of the times when I was showing a shift, when I was going to look for a shift in the story, is often a time when you would see this misogyny um, you know, sort of rearing its head. Okay, we're gonna look at pages eight and nine. So even in the first section before we have the introduction of Sabine, we have these instances that when you look back at them are really misogynist, but because we are um, still so sympathetic to our main character at this point, you don't quite read them as such. We're just gonna touch on them very quickly. Um, we have him walking out on page five of the office and um, he has this kind of uh, uncomfortable interaction with Cynthia, who is the receptionist, uh, where she's sort of checking in with him and he basically kind of blows her off. Then he's in the hallway and he comes across Monica, who he refers to as the Polish girl who cleaned after hours. And he doesn't even say hello to her. He doesn't address her. And he says the area where she is was hotter and smelled musty. So you have this sense of him wanting to escape and he's relieved once he leaves the space where she is and he doesn't even say hello to her. Then we have him sitting on the bus and he's sitting next to this woman who is very sweet. She's a, um, a, he calls her overweight and which he doesn't like, even though she's very respectful and moves over and makes space for him on the bus. Um, and he, she starts engaging him in conversation and he's so rude. He wants to really have nothing to do with her. And he says, when she asked about his weekend, he says, I'm just going to take it easy, Kowal said, threading the speech into a corner where it might go no further. So you have this beautiful, um, this, this sort of image of how he's, he's talking in a way that is really wanting to shut off any kind of communication with this woman who's really just trying to have a nice conversation with him. In fact, one of the things she talks about is, does he have any children? And so again, we have this notion of children um, and he says no. And she says, uh, you could be as well off, they'll break your heart. Um, so we have this idea of, of him not having children and about him having had a broken heart, which is again, ratcheting up this tension. But then the next thing we have is a pregnant woman who's really underscoring this idea that he is not in fact going to be able to procreate. He's not going to have this kind of narcissistic fantasy of having sons that are this extension of himself. So we have the pregnant woman and this first section ends with this really misogynist note that I don't think you recognize quite as such, 
because at this point you still are, are worried that this poor guy is going to have some sort of major health thing or major bad news of some sort. So, but at the end here, um, he's talking about this pregnant woman on the bus. Again, of course, this is um, the thing that is not going to happen for him. A lot of the story is about things not coming to fruition. And he said, she, Claire Keegan says, he sat breathing in her scent until it occurred to him that there must be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of women who smelled the same. It's so dismissive and so gross. Part of it is like you wonder if there's some sort of a pregnancy thing, but this idea that that women all smell the same is just such a dismissive and terrible thing. And it's delivered in this kind of like direct and kind of deadpan manner that's just really, um, when you go back and reread it, once you know what's going to happen, it's really pretty astonishing. Okay. So here on page 30, we have what I found one of the more offensive passages uh, in, in the book, where he is, when he finally sees Sabine for who she really is when she's moving into his space, which is important because she's moving her things into his space, which is, you know, once, once uh, things are actually becoming real, and he says maybe the reality is too much, um, once things are becoming real, he just basically can't take it. So uh, we have this passage. She looked different without her makeup, going around in a tracksuit, sweating and lifting things and making him lift and move his own things, the strain showing so clearly on her face. And there were pots and pans, a yoga mat, skirts and blouses, wooden hangers, a water filter, canisters of tea, a coffee grinder. So he's listing all of these things, which we could look at the symbolism of them. It would be very important um, and it would be very rewarding. A lot of them are domestic items um, and, and things that are important to her, but that for him, smack of, of her femininity and the fact that she is very different from him in a way that he finds totally repellent and he feels that he is being sort of violated by the entrance of her things. Um, and also this idea of, of when he sees her sweating and exerting, that, that he wants this, this vision of women that is so unrealistic. And once he sees her real self, uh, he essentially cannot deal. Maybe the most um, sort of blatant, uh, not illustration of misogyny, but the, the most blatant commentary on misogyny is on page 36. So um, we, this is again during their confrontation where we have um, Sabine really taking him to task and forcing him to look at some things. She says, you know what is at the heart of misogyny? What it comes down to? So I'm a misogynist now? It's simply about not giving, she said. Whether it's believing you should not give us the vote or not give help with the dishes, it's all clitched to the same wagon. Hitched, Koal said. What? It's not clitched, he said, it's hitched. You see, she said, is not this just more of it? You knew exactly what I meant, but you cannot even give me this much. It's such a beautiful, yet another example of, of um, you know, there being something that's a problem and then the person embodying it. So um, she's very clearly saying, do you know what's at the heart of, of misogyny? Um, and this idea of heart as, as being romantic, but also being the center of things and the fact that he has no heart and that the romance is sort of gone from the center of their relationship. And um, she says it's simply about not giving, but importantly, um, it's not giving us the vote. So you have this idea of, of like very important women's rights not being respected here and also not helping with the dishes. So this idea of not giving, not allowing women to have what they deserve. He doesn't give her space. He um, you know, doesn't give her money. He doesn't give her freedom. He doesn't give her credit. He doesn't give her an ability to be a real person. And then you have this incredible example where she says clitched to the wagon, um, which is, of course, it's also a little bit close to clit. It's, there's a lot, of, a lot of different resonances that are happening here. But she says clitched to the same wagon, and he has to correct her. And it's such a beautiful example, yet again, of Claire Keegan setting up this expectation for what a misogynist would do, and then having our narrator, um, our main character, do exactly that thing. It's so, so well done. 
So next, we're going to take a quick look at um, this, these intrusions of the past. So this is um, one of the things about the short story that's so beautiful is that it, it can be a very good uh, vehicle to show change because you sort of have an expectation. It's very like Chekhovian thing from Chekhov about um, like they're showing showing some sort of transformation. So um, you have this idea of, of past and present as both being, um, you know, sort of intertwined throughout the short story. So we're going to look on page 21. You have this idea of, of, of his father, of his childhood, of like a generation coming from the past and being uh, intruding on the present. So he's angry about um, th they have to resize the ring. I mean, and the ring is non-refundable, the wedding band. I mean, all of this is so symbolic. But he is angry because he has to pay extra for uh, for the resizing of the ring. Do you think I've made of money, he'd said, and immediately felt the long shadow of his father's language crossing over his life on what should have been a good day, if not one of his happiest. So you see this legacy of this kind of concern about money and this kind of um, tight fistedness and this lack of generosity as, as being a shadow. We saw the shadow in the very beginning. We're now seeing that same word shadow and it is the shadow in fact of his father's language this uh this idea do you think i'm made of money the, the shadow of of what he has inherited from his father on page 43 we have this really um stark example of cruelty so this is very importantly uh, this is claire keegan herself spoke about how this is an autobiographical moment this is when um the sons of the family and the father are in fact very cruel to the mother. So on page 43, this is Koal's remembering this. His mother had served everyone, brought their plates to the table, and they had begun to eat. When she went to sit down with her own plate, I mean, so rude, they're already eating and she's not even seated yet. When she went to sit down with her own plate, his brother had reached out and quickly pulled the chair from under her, and she had fallen backward onto the floor. She must have been near 60 years of age at that time, as she had married late, but his father had laughed. All three of them had laughed, heartily, and had kept on laughing while she picked the pancakes and the pieces of the broken plate up off the floor. It's so cruel, but you have this idea of, of the father as laughing. That's sort of one of the main things. You also have this sense of her as having married a little late. This is a small family. It's only the brother um, and Koal. So you have this idea of, of them as not being, you know, kind of the big Irish Catholic family that other families might have thought was sort of more kind of normal. His, her mom got a, his mom got a late start. There aren't very many uh, children in that family. And now he, in fact, is worried that he won't have children because he's such a jerk. No one's going to marry him. But so you have this sense of, of, of things not continuing, um, but also this idea of this legacy perpetuating across generations. In fact, we have this. If a part of Kahal now wondered how he might have turned out if his father had been another type of man and had not laughed, Kahal did not let his mind dwell on it. So again, these intrusions are coming, these memories from his past, the idea that he has received these things from his father, and yet he's rejecting them. These are things that he will not allow himself to think. The last thing we're going to do before we look at the close of the story is I'm just going to run through some of the extras that we do not have time to talk about because there's so there's so much um, so much to say here. But for example, um, we don't have enough time to really dig into the idea of the cat as this kind of familiar. So um, Matilda um, is this idea of mighty in battle is what Matilda means. And it's so crazy because first he locks her in the bathroom. He's locking Matilda in very much like Sabine. And then he locks her out of the house at the end. So he is expulsing her, expulsing, expulsing her from the house. Um, so we also have this idea of, of a woman um, in the story as being a forager. She is, you know, she's foraging for mushrooms, um, which is, there's a very sort of folklore and a very kind of fairy tale idea about this. But she's also someone who is the provider and the laborer. She's nurturing him by cooking for him. Um, so it, she has this very sort of domestic role and he's not even supporting her by happily paying for her supplies. 
Um, we didn't have time to talk very much about money and where Bill Furlong is too generous and is sort of perhaps uh, endangering his family by giving away too much. You have the opposite here where this man is so stingy and so withholding that he is, you know, ruining his chances at, at having any kind of a family. Um, we uh, didn't get a chance to talk about these streams of fluid that are interrupted. So he's at one point he's getting coffee and Cynthia interrupts him and he isn't able to put the sugar in his coffee because he's like so not wanting to talk to this woman at his office that he leaves um, and he has to drink this bitter coffee. Later, he doesn't pee in the bathroom. And at the very end, he does pee and feels very satisfied that he's able to urinate but um, it doesn't last for very long. And again, he ends up feeling, uh, you know, very sort of uh, full of self-contempt. There's so many intertexts. So intertexts are just other, um, you know, either um, books or, or movies or songs or things that are mentioned um, that, are, uh, that, that are talked about in the story that have resonance. So there's this idea of St. Stephen's Green as one of the places where uh, th that is mentioned in the book, which has lots to do with Joyce and with both Ulysses and Dubliners. Um, the woman on the bus who he is so rude about is reading a book called The Woman Who Walks Into Doors, the sense that, that, that this woman is not able to move through a door. You also, at one point, he's watching television later, um, and you have Dr. Phil and Judge Judy are both uh, mentioned. So you have this idea of Dr. Phil, you know, as being kind of this pop psychology doctor who is not very helpful for our coal. And then you also have Judge Judy, who is a woman who's in a, a position of authority in the United States, but who's hearing all of these ridiculous sort of squabbly fights, um, often among, uh, you know, married people or, or um, you know, all these sort of petty squabbles. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do is take a look at the end of this incredible story. When he reached the bedroom and unbuttoned his shirt and had taken his trousers off and lain down, he did not want to close his eyes. When he closed his eyes, he could see more clearly the white cuff of his wedding shirt poking out through the wardrobe door, the stack of unopened congratulatory cards and letters on the hall stand, the wedding dress she had insisted on showing him, the sons he would never have, and the non-refundable diamond ring, which he couldn't return, shining inside its box on the bedside table, and could hear her saying yet again and very clearly and so late in the day that she'd changed her mind and had no wish to marry him after all. It's so good. It's such a strong ending. So of course, um, in the beginning, he's walking into the bedroom, he's alone, he's lying down, he's taking off his trousers. I mean, this is a man who should be preparing to share his bed, and yet he is going and lying down by himself. And then when he, it's when he closes his eyes that he can see these things more clearly. He can see, you know, the, the, his own wedding clothes, her wedding clothes. And then this idea of the sons he would never have, you kind of move from things that he might have been able to see and then to these things that he um, can only see sort of in his mind's eye. And then after the sons, we have the idea of this non-refundable diamond ring. Um, it's, it's this very kind of like just very stingy sort of thing and very sort of bitter feeling that he's having and how it's shining in its box. And then I really love the fact that at the end, this story is ending with her voice. So um, he could hear her saying yet again and very clearly and so late in the day. So here we have our title, but this voice of hers is very clear and it's very direct that she'd changed her mind and had no wish to marry him after all. So I also really love the fact that this ends with after all. So after all here, um, you know, after all, after the whole entire story, that everything is coming, all, the whole story is working toward this word all. And after all is said and done, he's by himself. Hopefully he's reflecting on some of what has happened to him. Hopefully he is regretting some of his actions. Maybe he's learned something. He's at least acknowledging um, some of the things that have come from his family. Interestingly, there are a bunch of parts in the story where at one point um, his eyes are stinging and, and, and feel terrible and wet to him. 
And it's as if he can't even recognize that he's crying. There's an, also another part where he feels a, 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 like a physical sensation when he is very sad, but he can't um, identify it. So there's this sense of him as being very cut off from his emotions and his body. But in a story that's very focused on him the whole time, I love the fact that it is ending with her voice, which is so clear and so emphatic. And we have this nice kind of resonance with the title, but after all is said and done, she has escaped this misogynist and he is left alone uh, and, and sort of pondering her voice and, and all of the different things that she has brought to light during the course of this afternoon. So I hope that you have enjoyed um, this deep dive into So Late in the Day. I really found this entire collection so interesting. I did think that So Late in the Day, that story is the best of the three, but all of them are, are really, truly uh, worth reading and worth rereading. So uh, thank you for tuning in. You can now uh, get straight back to the Fox page and find something else to listen to. Happy reading.